a key swear amendment, please. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rudy is right here, please. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, something like that? I do. Doctor, can you tell the jury your name, please? Matthew Cornett. And what do you do? I'm an orthopedic surgeon whose practice is devoted to spine surgery. And where's your practice at? Uh, the Orthopedic Center of St. Louis, which is in St. Louis County, Missouri. And how long have you been a spine surgeon? I've been practicing exclusively spine surgery for almost 25 years. And before becoming a spine surgeon, could you just tell us a little bit about your medical school, uh, your residency, that type of thing? Sure. Well, I'm a St. Louis product, so I grew up here in St. Louis. Um, my undergraduate degree was at Washington University, St. Louis, where I graduated summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, and was a commencement marshal, which means I was at the top of my class. Uh, once I completed uh, undergraduate, I decided to go to medical school. So I, I went from uh, St. Louis to Baltimore, Maryland, where I attended the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And after completing that, I decided to specialize in orthopedic surgery. To do orthopedic surgery, you have to have one year of general surgery training, and that's followed by uh, four more years of orthopedics. I completed all that at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And once I completed my orthopedic training, I decided to specialize in spine surgery. To do spine surgery, you have to attend at least an additional year of exclusive training in spine surgery. I stayed at Johns Hopkins and had an appointment in the Department of Neurosurgery and Orthopedic Spine, completed that one year additional training, and then uh, was briefly a faculty member there, a junior faculty member, but a job opened up in my hometown, which is again St. Louis, and my wife and I moved back and we've been practicing here ever since. Your medical practice as it is today, <clears throat> the type of patients you see, do they just come from all walks, walks of life? Yes, I see uh, uh, patients from really all over the United States. Uh, were heavily involved in, in research, so some people, I think, through the internet and different things, really get our, our name through that. But it's a mixture of patients. We really specialize in neck and back pain, so if there are other areas of, of treatment that need spinal surgery, I may follow the patients, refer them to my colleagues at Washington University. They refer patients back to me, and um, I think it works better that way, so we, we stay in our area of expertise. Okay? And whether you want to put it on like a weekly basis or a monthly basis, how often do you do spine surgery? Uh, I see in, in clinic or in office about 120 patients a week. Um, yeah, for spine surgery, uh, I operate three days a week and I do anywhere from five to ten procedures in the operating room a week depending on the complexity. And you're Joe Lunsford's surgeon, is that correct? Yes, I'm his treating doctor. And you've been treating Joe Lunsford since August of 2014, is that accurate? I think that's fair, yes sir. So you've been treating Joe for a little over three years? Long time. You've treated him through two surgeries, correct? That's correct. A surgery to his back and a surgery to his neck, correct? Yes sir. Okay. And do you understand you're here to explain to us and to the jury uh, your diagnosis and your treatment of Joe? Yes. Yeah. Is it your conclusion that Joe suffered traumatic injuries to his neck and to his back? Yes, yeah, specifically, I think he injured some of the structures in his spine, both in his neck and low back, and when those structures are injured, like any other structure in your body, they can develop pain, and, and that is what we addressed with the treatment that we did. Okay. Let's talk about his lower back, and then we'll talk about his neck. Sure. Um, his lower back, um, what type of injuries did he have to his lower back? He had what's called an annular tear in his disc at L4, L5. Now, uh, the disc, the purpose of the spine is really to support you and protect your spinal cord. And if it was a solid structure, it would support you great, but then you wouldn't bend very much. So basically, I always tell my patients, God put discs that sit in between the bones. So if you have a bone here and a bone here, there's a disc that sits in between them. We always call the disc that sits in between them by the name of the bone above and the name of the bone below it. So in this situation, we number the bones in the low back. His disc injury in his low back was at L4, L5 disc. And I can illustrate that on one of the uh, uh, MRIs that we have here. Yeah, if you could do that just briefly for the sure. jury. And then we'll, get, we'll come back to it. Let's see if we've got this here. And I could probably hold it up, that'd be easier. And so what I would say here is, this is an MRI of Joe. It was dated 127.15. And what you see here are the discs, and you can see a brighter disc, a disc, a disc, a disc. The white is spinal fluid. That's part of uh, his spinal canal. The darker structures are the nerve and the spinal cord. 
What you see here is a bright spot at the back of the disc. I made a little black mark up to it. That is a what we call a high intensity zone signal, but that is synonymous with a tear or fissure in the disc itself. And that was consistent with his problem. The disc is a tough ring, and that tough ring usually is, is structurally maintained, it's solid. Uh, if the ring is torn, the ring has nerve fibers, just like if you tear something in your finger or you tear a cartilage in your knee, you get pain. In the same fashion, if you tear the ring of this disc, that causes structural pain in your back or your buttocks. But in addition, because there's inflammation, it can also irritate the nerves which run right by, and you can also get leg symptoms. And doctor, um, here's another copy of the 127-2015 MRI. Um, is that a fair and accurate copy or depiction? Yes, that just illustrates almost the exact MRI that we've just discussed. It's a little color-coded, so I think it aids in, in visualization. And that's, uh, I think, representative of the structural problem I just showed. Anything in addition to the annular tear with the uh, structural problem at the L4, L5 level? I think that was the main thing that we treated him for, at least from my recollection. Okay. And as far as the, uh, the injury to his neck, what type of injury did Joe have to his neck? A similar thing, again, the disc is a tough ring, and we felt that he had a disc injury at C5-6. And again, uh, I took the liberty to print a film of that, uh, a number of the bones. Again, this you can see is the discs are the dark structures, a number of the bones, two, three, four, five, and six. If we look at C5-6, you can see again, similar bright sequence here. It abuts up toward the spinal cord. It doesn't compress the spinal cord. But again, that's a structural injury to the disc and disc mechanism at C5, C6. And Dr. Sam, I will show you a, a colored version of that exhibit. It's marked as Exhibit MRI C spine JPEG. It's, uh, it's the same from the 4416, um, showing the colored in for to aid the jury in seeing what you're describing. Is yes. that a fair and accurate depiction? I think so. Okay. I think it's probably almost the same sequence I had yeah. here. So. Um, and they and they labeled it disc herniation and tear. Was that would you agree with that, or is herniation improper uh, labeling of that? I think it's a low level herniation. I also think that there is a tear in the disc, so I think that's appropriate. But again, this is not an issue of nerve compression. This is an issue of structural injury, no different than a torn cartilage or a torn rotator cuff in your shoulder is a structural injury to those body parts. It may not have anything to do with nerve compression. So. So these injuries to Joe's neck and his back, um, these are type of injuries that can cause pain? Oh, absolutely. Uh, require physical therapy? Yes. Pain injections? Yes. Uh, and, and ultimately surgery, correct? Again, what you try to do is start with conservative measures. All those are forms of conservative care. Those would be appropriate treatment. You always want to exhaust conservative care, such as therapy, chiropractic care in certain circumstances, injections, all that to try to make the patient's symptoms go away without doing surgery. But if that fails and we have obvious structural problems that we think we can benefit the patient, the next step would be surgery. When someone has a, an injury like this, um, it's possible without a successful surgery that their symptoms could be permanent. Yes, very much so. Okay. And even with a successful surgery, there'll be some lingering symptoms with vigorous activity or strenuous activity. Well, what I would say here is I'm not God. I can't make a patient perfect. In this particular situation, referring to Joe, I think he's had an excellent result. Do I think he's perfect? Absolutely not. Is he the way he was before his injury? No. Is he very good? Yes. Do I think he had a good result? Yes. So I think all patients would say they're not perfect. They probably, if you stress them in certain ways, always will have some level of symptoms. I think Joe is no different than in any of those patients. Okay. So it's your conclusion, uh, within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, that Joe needed pain injections, which we'll talk about. Yes. Correct. Uh, that would be appropriate conservative care, yes, sir. Physical therapy. Yes. You sent him to Apex Physical Therapy. Yes. Um, he had multiple MRIs and CTs before and after his surgeries. That's appropriate, isn't it? Yes. And that the surgery to his neck and back, um, that he needed those as well. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> And based on your examination, your history, your treatment of Joe as his surgeon, uh, is your belief that more likely than not that Joe suffered these injuries to his neck and his back as a result of the car crash he reported to that happened on July 8th, 2014?
Yeah, so uh, we, we do a lot of work, in particular research work in this area, and I believe that these injuries are the type of injuries that one can easily sustain in this type of accident. And major symptoms of disc injuries in the neck and the back can include, we already talked about pain, uh, decreased mobility. Well, you get, obviously with any injury, your body's response is to tighten the muscles. That's a protective mechanism. So what we see is you can get muscle spasms, stiffness, headaches, are a big thing. People can get a lot of headaches after accidents. Uh, they can get weird tingly paresthesias. They can have uh, frank numbness. They can have weakness. All those are possibilities after these types of disc injuries. And those are the types of things that can affect someone's activities of daily living of their everyday life. Oh yes, the neck pain and headaches alone are uh, can be disabling. And do a lot of your patients with neck and back injuries have those types of symptoms? It's interesting. Um, Neck injuries in different facets don't often uh, necessarily have the, the headaches, but in particular, whiplash type injuries or injuries in motor vehicle accidents seem to have an increased incidence of the headaches associated. And, and often we're looking at research right now, but the headaches to me are, are predictors often of the best outcome. And so they're very often associated with these type of injuries. And uh, if we can't get them better with the type of conservative care you've already outlined that we would move forward with surgery. And it's very interesting, the headaches almost resolve right away, right after surgery, even in the recovery room, patients will tell us their headaches have gone. So it's, 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 it's actually a very gratifying surgery. Um, and you have other patients in your practice that have injuries similar to Joe's who end up needing surgery as well, correct? Absolutely. And uh, do you have you have other patients in your practice that have injuries similar to Joe's that are also from car crashes, correct? Yes, those are the group that I refer to in the axial neck pain um, submission. Those are, are a lot of those patients. Okay. So let's uh, let's talk about your treatment of Joe and okay. the basis for your diagnosis. Um, Doc, I'd like to start with uh, the emergency room records. And I'm going to hand you what's been done for identification is Joe Meds 3 which is the emergency room record from the day of the crash. And it looks like he reported that at 11.30 a.m. today, quote, head-on collision going 55 miles an hour, complained of neck, back, and leg pain. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Then also on uh, page Joe Meds 4, it states that he was struck head-on by another that crossed the center line. Do you see that as well? Yes. Okay, are those complaints consistent with what you saw when you began treating Joe? These are the type of complaints. Again, patients early on, their symptoms evolve, but these are the type of things you see after a motor vehicle accident. They're the type of things we would see after these type of injuries. And the clinical impression or the final diagnosis was contusion of the knee and then back strain, initial encounter, then sprain of the cervical neck. Um, and I'll show that to you. And again, is that consistent with the injuries that Joe had? Well, this is again a diagnosis made by some in the emergency room what I would say is that these are the type of impressions people have early on but we know that his injuries were much more than a strain in the neck so a strain in the back yeah and actually to go along with that line of thought um, on Joe Med 7 it's indicated the patient reports adrenaline and no pain at the scene but now has neck back and bilateral knee pain um, they had a c-collar in place you know, that's kind of consistent that at first, you know, people may not feel the pain and then it progresses as the, uh, the injury becomes more apparent. What I would say is his symptoms and diagnosis in the emergency room are consistent with treatment in the ER, a diagnosis in the ER. We're much more sophisticated than that, but they've obviously are ruling out a fracture or something unstable that could be life-threatening. So uh, all that treatment and those complaints are consistent with what we see. Then they were, uh, the emergency room instructed them to follow up with the doctor, and that's reasonable and necessary, isn't it? Yes. And he was treated at the uh, the Center for Interventional Pain Management from about July 24 to October 13, and was told just to treat exclusively with you when you were starting to treat him. Again, going in and seeing someone uh, for pain management after injuries like this, that's reasonable and necessary, isn't it? Uh, again, what I would tell you is that um, uh, Conservative care, injections, physical therapy are appropriate measures uh, to take early on to try to assist somebody to alleviate their symptoms after an accident such as this. Okay. 
And it looks like you first saw Joe on uh, August 15, 2014. And do you have that record in front of you, Doctor? If not, I yes, I do. And what were his complaints on August 15, 2014, a little over three years ago? Low back pain to both sides, neck pain with headaches to both trapezius, which is the muscle on the side of your neck, and to both shoulders. Uh, did he report that he was wearing a seatbelt and that a trash utility truck crossed over, striking him head on? That's correct. And he stated that his pain began about an hour after. That's correct. And that, uh, did he tell you, it also indicates in your record that he followed up to see Dr. Pata? That's correct. Okay. And an MRI was performed and some physical therapy was done. Is that what he told you? Yes. Okay. And then there was an MRI scan mentioned in your, uh, your August 15, 2014 record. What was, the, what was the importance of the MRI scan? Uh, the MRI scan from 8514 uh, revealed again the tear in the disc that I've illustrated uh, here at L45. Uh, I did not have a cervical MRI available at that time, but that was the one that brought in. And so, uh, to me, the objective pathology, something that we can clearly define on MRI, was was consistent with the disc injury and consistent with his subjective complaints that he described um, in our history. Okay. And under social history, he told you about his family a little bit. Correct. Um, that he's married and has five children. That's correct. Okay. And also talked about he owns a uh, cable lineman business. Did he tell you about his work? Yes. So after August 15, 2014, um, I guess you recommended for him to follow up with you on October 9, 2014. That's when you next saw him, correct? Correct. Okay. And what were his complaints in October of 2014? It was neck pain. Um, on October 9th, uh, again, we were seeing him for his neck, uh, tingling into his left shoulder, left arm. He still had the headaches. Um, we talked about his structural problem there. I talked, discussed, I believe he had an MRI that day, and I showed him the disc injury that I thought was present. And um, I told him that I would like to treat this with a simple steroid injection there. And I told him I would see him back. I felt he could work full duty at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, I also talked to him about a potential steroid injection at L45 on each side to try to blanket that disc injury to see if we could calm things down. Okay. And, and tell the jury a little bit about what are these um, steroid injections? Well, I think that everybody who's seen an injury, whether it's a sprained ankle or a twisted knee or any other structural injury, and what happens is there's inflammation. That's why you get redness, you get swelling. Just picture that you have that down at the microscopic level in, around the disc that's been injured. Oftentimes, and we've all heard of cortisone shots in the shoulder or the knee, if you put cortisone which blocks inflammation, you can block that inflammation response, and by blocking that response, the symptoms improve the patient recovers and they can move on uh, with their quality of life and hopefully avoid surgery. So the principle behind this is to stop inflammation um, and that's what's being done. Okay. And he also noted that uh, he was having significant low back pain to both sides, is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. And um, it looks like you also noted that he had an obvious annular tear at L4, L5. Correct. Okay, and L4, L5, that's the lower back, correct? That's the level we discussed already. Okay. So we had a, you had abnormalities, looks like you say a, a disc herniation C5, 6 um, on the MRI. Um, he has significant low back pain and an obvious annular tear at L4, L5, and that was, was that the reason that you recommended the uh, injections? Yes, because of the injuries, yes sir. Okay. And then you follow up with him again on uh, December 8th, 2014. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay, so we're about two months later, and is that to see if the, the pain injections work? It was really a follow up to see whether he had a response to this conservative care they would ordered, and unfortunately, um, he did not. Um, and so we told him the next step would be to move forward with further evaluation to see if we can make him better uh, with surgery. And if so, what surgery do we need to do? Okay, and then you indicate, it looks like you recommended a, uh, a new MRI. That's correct. Okay, and why is that? Well, the new MRI is called MRI spectroscopy, and what we have looked at is we can identify chemicals in the disc that, after a disc is injured, to cause, that cause back pain. So we are working with uh, Siemens uh, worldwide. Siemens is a large company like GE that, that 
develops MRIs. So we work with them. We worked with doctors at Stanford. And what we've done is, is figured out that there are certain chemicals in the disc that cause back pain. We are able to measure the disc with this special MRI. So it'll take a chemical biopsy of your disc without actually sticking a needle in you. And what we found was that L4-5 showed suspected painful chemicals and L5-S1 showed some suspected painful chemicals. So that was information that helps us further understand his structural back pain. And based on that, we recommended further treatment, which was a CT discogram. And they also indicate a, uh, a CT myelogram as well. Uh, that's right. A CT myelogram, again, showing no other pathology, no facet pathology, nothing else that would cause, we think, structural problems um, that he was complaining of. Okay. And doctor, without getting too much into the weeds, can you, can you tell us what is a CT myelogram and what is a CT discogram? Sure. So let me go to the report and then I'll discuss uh, each um, with you regarding that. So what I would say is a CAT scan is a type of x-ray and it, it oftentimes CAT scans are done in the emergency room because they're very fast and they give you information. What we're looking for specifically with a, uh, the CT myelogram in his lumbar spine is we're looking at structures that could cause pain. It, it is a different test than an MRI. An MRI sort of gives you more soft tissue. The CT myelogram shows you more bony problems. So we were looking for nerve, any nerve compression, any fragment of bone that could be causing this that we're not picking up on the MRI. So it complements us and gives us more information. The discogram is different. That's also a CAT scan, but what we've done is we place a needle inside the disc and we fill the disc up. If we believe the disc is torn and we fill it up, obviously we should be able to see a tear on the disc itself. And so the CAT scan discogram is the test that looks at that. In addition, by filling the disc up, if the patient says when they have their tear leak out of their disc, they say, that's where my back pain is. We know that their back pain is associated with that tear with that particular space in the spine. And so it's, it's, it's allowing us to get a multiple checks on where pathology is coming from, and that helps us develop a more sophisticated treatment plan to hopefully address these issues. And then so it, again on, um, on December 8, 2014, you're sending them out for a new MRI to get a CT myelogram and with a tentative plan for a, a lumbar fusion in the lower back at L4, L5. Is that correct? That was our tentative plan, yes. Okay. And then that, oh, here at the last line, I was talking about the MRI spectroscopy, which you already uh, indicated. We addressed, yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, and then it looks like you saw him then about two and a half months later on February 12, 2015. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And tell us about your examination on February 12, 2015. Well, he's really coming back and reviewing the test. The CAT scan myelogram did not show severe or significant nerve compression. So again, this is a structural injury to the spine without a lot of neurologic compression. So that's what we knew we were dealing with. The MRI spectroscopy did show chemicals that cause back pain at L4, L5 disc and L5S1. So based on that information, we wanted to test this disc and this disc to make sure is his back pain coming from this disc and not this disc also. So that was ordered and then I saw him back several um, weeks later. And you recommended further pain injections with his neck? Um, I believe that's the case, yes sir. Okay. And it looks like you also noted at the bottom doctor that um, that the pain affects all aspects of his life, his quality of life, his ability to do simple household chores, and his relation with his family. Yeah. Okay. And is that um, is that something you see with other patients with these types of injuries? Yes. Okay. Now you talked um, you talked a little bit about the structural injury that's going on, and mm -hmm. we're at this point you're leaning towards, or at least you're recommending the uh, surgery to the lower back. Um, why aren't we going forward with the surgery on the neck at this point? Is it something where you want to treat one at a time, or is it just the neck wasn't bad enough at that time? Well, initially he had a good response with the injection in his neck. We, again, are trying to manage him conservatively. His back was the bigger issue, so we're focusing on that. Um, and again, still, we didn't feel we had exhausted conservative care in his, in his neck at this point. So, 
uh, eventually will shift to his low back completely, and then depending on how he feels, we may shift back to his neck okay. uh, based on his clinical improvement or lack of improvement that's sustained over time. And then so about a month later, you saw him on March 16, 2015, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and did you review the discogram at that uh, appointment? Yes, I reviewed that with him. It showed a large tear in the disc. So, in other words, at this point now, we have painful chemicals at L4-5. We have a tear in the disc on MRI at L4-5. We have a CT discogram that showed back pain coming from L4-5 with a large tear in the disc. So everything lines up. And in addition, we had a question mark about L5-S1, but that disc was negative. So we felt very comfortable that we were dealing with a structural injury to his disc at L4-5. All the tests lined up, and so we recommended doing a fusion surgery there. Did you explain the risks of surgery to uh, Mr. Lunsford? Yes. And it looks like you indicated some of those risks in your note. Uh, what were those risks? Well, we make an incision on the belly, and the purpose is, is if we can fix his structural back problem without ever cutting on his back, he's going to be way ahead. But belly incisions, you could get a hernia, a wound infection. The big worry on the front of the spine is damage to blood vessels. So you could have catastrophic blood loss or death, or bleed to death from that. You could damage the, the, the tubes from your kidneys called the ureters. So there's all kinds of issues that are associated with that. We went through those risks and benefits uh, that day. Surgery serious in yeah. my opinion. So <laughs> um, it's a major surgery, isn't it, Doctor? Same right answer. What I would say is that this is not a small surgery. It has significant uh, uh, potential uh, problems associated with it, um, and we felt those were manageable. But clearly, this is not just a, 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 a simple you know, excision of a mole or something like that. And did you mention that you guys went in uh, anteriorly or posteriorly? We went in the front of his spine. Okay, is that a more complicated surgery than going in from the back? I don't know if it's more complicated, but what it does do is it has different risks associated with it. I think more people are familiar with cutting on your back, but again, we've also heard of a lot of horror stories of people getting back surgery and not doing well. So in this situation, we felt very comfortable this was the right route for him. Yes, it has inherent risk. Those were explained to him. But I was pretty confident I could make a big difference in his life. Okay. And you also discussed with him, it looks like, according to your note, um, adjacent level failure over his lifetime and the stress on the adjacent levels. Uh, can you explain that to us, please? Well, it's, it's pretty, to some extent, intuitive that in a situation where I'm locking you here, we know if you're locked here and you have movable segments, all the stress goes here or below it. So what happens is once you're locked, your body has to adjust. It still wants to move when you bend and, and over to touch your toes or tie your shoes or go to the bathroom. So that stress tends to line up at the adjacent segments to wherever you're locked. That's called an adjacent level failure. That is something that's well described in the literature. It is predictable. It will occur over time. Um, and so that is something that he needed to understand that even though I'm fixing him, this is something that he will develop in the future. Okay. And it also indicated uh, the, at the last line of your note that his pain and his symptoms affect all aspects of his life and his quality of life. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And it looks like we finally uh, we do get to surgery um, nine days later on March 25th, 2015. Is that correct? Correct. And that was a, uh, a lumbar fusion at the L4, L5 level? Yes. And again, the L4, L5 is the lower back? That is correct. Okay. Um, can you describe to the jury generally what that surgery is like? Well, I have, a, I think, a pretty good picture here. This is probably the best view. So but exhibit uh, three. Yes, and there's other views with this. But again, we're coming at him from the front. Here's his disc at L4-5. The disc is injured. We take out the injured disc and any of those bad chemicals that are causing back pain. We're actually, just like the prize at the bottom of a cereal box, you can see the tear at the back of the disc. We were able to identify it, remove anything that was causing <coughs> irritation. But once you remove the disc between the bones, there's nothing there. And so if you don't provide some structural support, the patient will have horrible back pain. So what we do is we support this with these metal devices. We put allograft bone or cadaver bone in there. We use bone proteins called infuse, which allows bone to form. 
And this ties all this together to make this one piece. But again, as this is one piece over time, what you'll find is that there will be more stress here and here. So we were able to structurally stabilize that segment. Uh, we identified the tear that we saw on all the other studies. Uh, and then we provided stability by placing these cages in bone. Doctor, I want to show you what I have marked as exhibit CTL spine, which is an image of the, uh, the lumbar spine. Looks like from July 3rd, 2015. And uh, in red, is that also showing the cage or what you put in there? Yes, that is uh, the two cages. That is looking from the front back view as opposed to this was the sideways view. Okay. And so that's a fair and accurate depiction of what you were talking about, just a different angle. Yes, that's correct. And so you mentioned that when you were uh, doing the surgery, um, you did find that large annular tear. That's correct. Okay. And you also did decompression? Well, we remove any of that material that goes through there, so we are able to see the nerves. We remove the tear from the nerves that are potentially irritating them secondarily. So we did that, and then we provided stability. And so were your findings in the surgery, were those consistent with what you were seeing before the surgery on the MRI and what you believed you were going to find when you went in? Yes, absolutely they were. And then so about... So Joe goes through surgery, and what do you tell him as far as recovery, what he needs to do after surgery? He needs to behave, he needs okay. to be smart about his back, um, just go home and take it easy, um, allow himself to heal. Um, so. And it looks like he, um, he followed up with you about two weeks later, uh, yes. it looks like on uh, April 13, 2015, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. What did you do at the follow-up appointment? Well, we take x-rays, we look at his wound, we remove any staples or sutures that he may have. Um, we talk to him about what the next steps are, so forth. And he was doing well? Yes. Okay. And he yeah, was having improvement? He, he felt dramatically improved. Uh, he was doing extremely well and he's only two weeks out. So already he can feel a huge difference from his surgery. Um, and that made a big difference for him. Um, but this is a surgery that takes some time to recover from. Just because he feels improved doesn't mean he's ready to go to work or load this. I always tell people it's like pouring a concrete driveway just because it looks good doesn't mean you're ready to put your truck on it. And so in this situation, this is nowhere near healed two weeks after surgery. He has to be off work for a period of time to allow that bone to cure, harden, and handle the mechanical loads that he places on it. Yeah, and you noted on, um, on that visit of uh, April 13, 2015 that he still has pain with rotation and other movement, correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, that he was followed with you in four weeks yes. under the impression plan, um, <clears throat> and that you indicated that he was temporarily totally disabled. So at that point, he's totally disabled, correct? Yes. Okay. And he needed to continue to wear a back brace, so she had a back brace on him? Yes, sir. That's correct. But that he could start driving soon? Yeah. Okay. Looks like I have is the next follow up is May 11, 2015. Is that accurate? That's correct. Or? Yes. Okay. And so we're about six weeks post-surgery. Yes. Okay, and it's, um, it, I guess it marks that there's a good but slow improvement. Is that accurate? Yes, I think he was right on target. At the bottom, it says fairly straight back overall in alignment. Um, what do you mean by that, or what, is there any significance to that statement? We're looking at his overall alignment because that plays a role long-term in, um, in his overall health, just like if your car tires are a little out of a line, you may have more significant wear. And it's important because he did have what we call a slight sinking in of his cages, and that can change his alignment a little bit. So from our standpoint, we were watching that. I felt um, that it wasn't progressing. The settling was there on the first x-rays. It hadn't progressed, but that may affect his overall alignment down, down the line. And then your plan was you asked him to begin walking and doing abdominal strengthening? Yes. Was he on orders not to walk at all before this, or is this more long walks? More long walks, start to recondition himself is really what I'm, I'm suggesting. Okay. And anything in particular with abdominal strengthening, is it just through physical therapy or is that just some home exercises? We give him home exercises. Okay. Yes, and then it looks like your impression at that time or the plan is to follow up in about six to eight weeks and then to do another CT to see how things are looking. That's correct. We CT the patients at three months and six months and one year, generally, to look at fusion. Okay, just to make sure everything's fusing right. That's correct. And you also released him to work light duty with a 10-pound limit. 
That's correct. Okay, and no repetitive bending, lifting, and he needs to alternate between sitting and standing. Is that right? Correct. So about six weeks later, later, um, you see him on July 13th, 2015. I believe that's the next visit. Is that right? Yes. Tell us about your exam on July 13th, 2015. Is, is he still progressing well? Yes, he's having some referred pain in his hips. That's normal referred. Most patients afterwards, we describe they get pain in their hips. Uh, and we see that commonly. That tends to go away over time. I told him about that. His CT scan showed good early bone consolidation. I didn't see there was any change in this sinking in of the cages. So I felt pretty comfortable that he was right on target with where he needed to be. I recommended um, uh, some physical therapy closer to where he lived. And that's Apex Physical Therapy? That's correct. Okay. And then a follow-up with me, but um, he was uh, still very pleased with his progress. And then uh, follows up again on July 30th, 2015. Correct. Right? It looks yes. like he was in a little bit of a fender bender. Yes. Okay. And um, it looks like you guys made sure that that didn't affect the fusion. I wanted to make sure he didn't move his cages or anything else. And so I told him, uh, based on the x-rays, um, uh, I directly compared it. There was no change. I didn't. I wasn't really worried that it can cause a temporary flare-up. But I, you know, he was still uh, doing relatively well. I told him to continue his physical therapy. So he's still doing well. And uh, follow up again as scheduled. Looks like on um, <coughs> September 28th, 2015. I know this is we're going through a lot of visits, but you did treat him for three years. Um, so I got to turn 20, 2015, is that the next visit? Yes, sir. And so that's about six months post-surgery, is that accurate? Yes. Okay, and uh, under clinical findings, you discussed that the adjacent levels appeared to be healthy? Yes. Um, what's the significance of that, doctor? Well, again, we already said that the adjacent levels are going to have more stress. We, we will look at those over time to make sure we don't see a collapsing of the disc or anything else that would indicate on plain x-ray that we should get an MRI to look more closely. So in his six-month visit, his, his exam was normal. He was doing well. Uh, he was very pleased. I, I told him I thought he could go back to work full duty, no restrictions. And I told him our next follow-up would be uh, in three months. So based on what you're seeing um, on September 28, 2015, the clinical picture and what you're seeing, you're seeing a patient who's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Yes. And he's going to his physical therapy. He's taking care of himself. Yes. And he's healing well. Yeah. Okay. Any indication that he's not following instructions or doing anything to impede his healing? No, his healing was excellent. His response to treatment, you know, was exactly where we thought it should be. Um, he's having a very good result at this point. And then back in July of 15, he had that little scare with that fender bender, but you guys checked that out. Not only on back on July 30th, 2015, but you checked it out again on September 28th, 2015 by checking the adjacent levels. Is that correct? There was no indication that this minor accident caused any change in his back pain. It was not a complication. He went on to heal well. He's had an excellent result with his back. Great. And then uh, that takes us to January 4th of 2016. It looks like that's the next visit he has with you. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay, and so that's nine months um, after his back surgery. That's correct. And again, I think you indicated he's very pleased with his progress. Correct. Um, but does he, is he still having complaints with his neck? Yes. Um, can you tell us about that? Well, it's the same complaints he had originally. We talked about his disc problem. Uh, I told him I would repeat the steroid injection again. Remember, we had repeated it. He, he gets a good relief for a period of time. And then I told him we would rescan him and see him back. I, I didn't feel like I needed to take him off of work. He could still work full duty. But I felt this was similar to what we see here with these disc injuries. And so I we talked about all that, and um, I wanted to see him back after that treatment had been provided. Okay. So on January 4, 2016, we're about a year and a half from the car crash, and he's still having problems with his neck. Yes, I think that's a fair statement. And so at this point, you're still recommending continue with the steroid injections. Let's see if the conservative therapy helps. Yes. Okay. It looks like the next visit he has with you is on April 4th of 2016. Is that correct, doctor? That's correct. And we reviewed a new MRI at that point, and it essentially showed the same problem, C5-6, that he had in the past. He also checked on his back as well. Well, yeah, we followed him because that's his one-year follow-up. So okay. x-rays on his back look excellent. The CT shows a solid fusion, so he has gone on to heal. We did not see any problems. 
it, you know, his back, he, he's doing very well. He's very pleased. Okay. He did look at an MRI on April 4, 2016. Correct. Okay, and what did that show again, Doctor? The MRI showed the disc injury at C5-6, which we've already described. Okay. And did you recommend further injections on that day? Yeah, that was one. We wanted, before we did an injection, to make sure it was the same issues. It was the same issue. We inject, recommended an injection there. Unfortunately, that injection did not give him more sustained relief. And so we recommended at the next visit surgery. And that next visit, I believe, is um, was June 7, 2016. That's correct. Okay. And he's still having neck complaints, and you recommend a surgery. That's correct. I think there was a mention of a CT myelogram. Yeah, it says he will require a CT myelogram. Yes, the same issues that we had for his low back. We want to look at the bone. We want to look at the facet joints because our treatment in his neck is a little different. We're going to try to preserve motion there. So remove the disc injury, but preserve motion. In his low back, we remove the disc injury, but we stop motion. That's called a fusion. Preserving motion is a disc replacement, so we need to make sure his joints look okay. okay. And again, with, with the surgery, with the lower back surgery, there are risks and complications with the neck surgery as well. Yes. And it looks like you discussed those with him on, um, on June 7, 2016. It says, your note indicates we've talked about long-term consequences. Do you see where I'm talking? Yes. Okay. And it talks about facet failure. What's that? Well, again, what I always like my patients to understand is, look, I'm doing this. I think you're going to do well with this. Um, and, and so forth, but we follow all our patients long term. What we find is that the mode of failure in the cervical spine is, is again, putting a disc in isn't the quality of motion God gave you. So the quality of that motion isn't quite as good. That puts more stress on the adjacent levels, not as fast as, say, a fusion, which locks you, but it still accelerates a problem at the adjacent levels. The second thing that you can have as opposed to an adjacent level problem is that the joints, because there's movement, and again the quality of motion isn't good, the joints can wear out. So those are the two modes of failure that we see generally after a cervical disc replacement. Okay. So there's potential complications and then there's potential future surgery or risk of future surgery because of the adjacent level failure, correct? Injection laden? What I would say is again, there are issues that develop that may require future surgery in his neck uh, and his low back, and that's what we try to discuss with him. But despite the, the risks that come along with the surgery, um, you still recommended it and believe it would benefit him, correct? Yes, I was convinced it would. Yeah, and it ultimately did, right? Yes. Okay. And I think you indicated, uh, did you indicate that the pain was affecting all aspects of his life still? It was more the headaches. Again, he's working with this, he's trying to do it, but it's a different type of effect on your quality of life. The back pain is so much at the core of where you are that you can't hardly do anything, but the neck pain and headaches, it's, it's how you focus and do work, and so it's a different aspect that it affects you. So It looks like also you were prescribing some medication on that day? Yes. And these are the types of medications you would prescribe someone with these types of symptoms? Yes, sir. It looks like the next visit is July 7th of 2016. Is that accurate? That's correct. And there's a mention in your note about um, discussing motion analysis. Uh, could you tell us about that, please? Um, we do a lot of research. Um, we work with a uh, company called Medical Metrics in Houston, Texas. They do all the motion analysis for all the FDA clinical trials for disc replacement. What we are doing is a, a study on whiplash injuries, looking at how much change um, in motion at the injured segment. He had some increase in motion at the injured segment of C5-6, 1.5 standard deviations um, beyond normal. Uh, and so that was just information that we had available to us we're still looking at that. He wasn't a huge outlier. Sometimes we see two, three, or four standard deviations, but he had an uptick in his motion, and that uptick in his motion is consistent with the disc injury. Okay. And that showed an objective abnormality at C5, C6, correct? The objective abnormality at C5, 6 was consistent with the objective abnormality on his MRI. So all these things are correlating, and it correlates with his symptoms, again, treating like or similar patients. And these abnormalities, again, we've already spoken on, either they're peer-reviewed, we have publications regarding that, and that's contained in the CV. And an objective abnormality means that you can see it through testing, you don't have to just rely on the patient's complaints. That's true, we can measure it. Yes, sir. Okay. 
And it looks like at that time, what's your recommendation, a uh, cervical disc replacement at C5-6? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Now, on the, on the back, you did a, a fusion. Um, and I guess that does exactly what it sounds like it does. It kind of fuses the bones together, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, why, uh, with the next surgery, would you do a, uh, a cervical disc replacement instead of a fusion, like you did with the lower back? Because if you can address the structural problem and preserve motion, that's always better than addressing a structural problem and stopping motion. And so, from our standpoint, um, we believe we have long-term data to support cervical disc replacement as a better alternative um, than fusion, and so that's why we moved in that direction. So you believe you get a better result for the patient? Yes. And you see that? Yes. Okay. And so you guys decided, um, or it was decided to move forward with the neck surgery? That's correct. Okay. And that was that neck surgery performed on July 13, 2016? That's correct. Can you describe to us uh, that procedure just generally? Generally, there's an incision made on the front of your neck. We move the uh, carotid artery and the jugular vein out of the way. We move your windpipe and food pipe out of the way. We put retractors in. We identify it and make sure we're in the right spot. Once we bring in the microscope and I'll remove the disc just like I did in the front of the lumbar spine, but we're using it through a small hole. And once that disc is removed, I can again identify the tear in the disc and the structural injury. But again, if there's nothing that's put back in the disc itself, patients will have terrible neck pain. So in addition, we put an artificial disc into position. That artificial disc is screwed into place. This is one of the first versions, but from our standpoint, it's a very uh, healthy, um, stable version. This is what it looks like here. That's exhibit five. Yes, and there's a little ball and socket here. So that allows him to move. Um, and still provide stability in his spine. So this is what we did in his neck. Again, his chin is up here. We approach him from the front and we place that. His spinal cord runs right back there, so it's placed almost um, back to the edge of the spine, right next to the spinal cord. Uh, it's secured in position by screws, and this will preserve motion in that segment. Doctor, I just want to show you a couple of exhibits. One is one of the CT images from December 5th, 2016, exhibit marked Exhibit CT-C-Spine. And is that also showing the uh, the implant? Yes, and it shows it right up to the back where the spinal cord is. Yes, sir. That's a fair and accurate depiction. Yes, except again, it's, it, I would characterize it as a implant and screws, not a cage, because I think it's really a ball and socket. So. And one other question, when you were describing you know, the, the incision uh, for the cervical surgery, um, I'm going to show us what marked as exhibit cervical surgery. For illustrative purposes, is that generally a fair and accurate depiction of what that's like? Yeah, so I think that's a fair description. It doesn't show all the stuff I move out of the way, but I think it's reasonable, yes. Just for illustrative purposes. Put in what's called, I guess, a prestige disc implant? Yes, prestige ST. There's also a prestige LP, which is the newer version. So as opposed to a fusion, that's an implant that allows motion and movement. That's correct. And were your surgical findings uh, consistent with the MRI and the CTs? Yes, sir. Okay, now, uh, Mr. Lunsford was taken back off work as a result of this surgery, right? Yes. And then I guess he had a follow-up with you, looks like about three, four weeks later on August 8th, 2016. That's correct. And indicates here that, um, that he has had a remarkable result. Yes, he's doing very well. And the film showed good position of the device. Yes. And on this date, did you release him to light duty? Yes. Okay, so was that again uh, less than 10 pounds with lifting? Yes. And I think you also indicated, you indicate no overhead work? Correct. So he's doing well, doing what he's supposed to do, uh, being a good patient, right? Yes. And it looks like the next visit's on September 8th, 2016. Is that accurate? Correct. You indicate here that he's still doing very well? Extremely well. He's very pleased. Um, his exam is normal, x-rays look good, I recommend he return to work um, full duty. The only restriction I had is no climbing um, from climbing poles. I, I thought that that was bad to pull on this right now, I didn't want him to do that. I told him our next bulk would be in six to eight weeks, I told him he could start exercising. And you know the climbing poles was part of his work as being a uh, That was my understanding, that's why I wanted that restricted. Okay. Next was on 12-5 of 16.
Okay, and he's still doing well, um, the healing's doing well, is that correct? Yes, he's very pleased, he thinks he's uh, doing extremely well, and um, I released him full duty, no restrictions at that point. And then uh, you followed up again with him on uh, March 6, 2017? Yes. And he's still doing well? Uh, that's correct. Um, it's indicated that he has occasional tingling into his left arm. Yes. Um, did you do any investigation into that, or what do you believe that's from? Uh, it could be from a lot of things. It could still be residual nerve irritation. It could be uh, some peripheral entrapment. Um, at this point, it, it was noted it wasn't severe enough for me to work him up more fully, but it's something that um, I just wanted to make sure it was placed in the record. Um, so you indicated on your impression plan uh, that he continues to do extremely well, correct? Yes. All right. But then you indicated obviously has pain with vigorous activities. Yes. Um, and I guess that goes to, does that go to what you're saying before is, you know, we can get a good result, but you're not God, you're not going to make him perfect how he was before. Well, what I would say is, is compared to when I saw him, I think he's had a great result, but he's not perfect. And, and in this situation, he understands that some of these things that maybe he could do with impunity before and not worry about it, he's not going to be able to do that without having discomfort. And I think that's normal. I think he was more than willing to accept that trade-off compared to what he was. Um, so he's still relatively pleased, but I had, part of my job is to educate him and help him understand why these things happen the way they do. I don't have, I don't think, the most recent records. Um, did you see him after? Okay. I always see him at one year, so all patients are followed uh, like an FDA clinical trial. His final follow with me that I have on record is 7-2017, which would be a two-year follow-up for his low back and a one-year fall for his neck. And um, so, it, again, it's indicated here that uh, he's having dramatic improvement, or I guess those are your words, correct? Yes. And his neck is doing well. Yes. And, and you're indicating here that he's still having low level of symptoms in his neck and back, particularly with vigorous activity. Yes. Um, and he understands this will be permanent. Yes. Um, and that, again, that's to be expected. I think that'll be permanent, and he has to accept that. Um, and I think he was more than willing to do so. And then it looks like, he, I guess he discussed with you that he's tried to adapt. I guess he's tried to make some lifestyle changes. Okay. Well, do you recall, doctor, when it indicated here that it says he's tried to adapt? Yeah. Well, I think what he that does is, I think he works a little differently. There's certain mm -hmm. things he can't do that he used to do uh, in his job, but, um, you know, he's working around that. He's doing the best he can. That's what I would expect for someone uh, like Mr. Lunsford. Um, you know, and we emphasize the positive, not focus in on, on the negative side. Okay. And doctor, are you qualified to discuss the cost of medical treatment? I think so. It's been marked for identification as exhibit Joe's Bills 1 through 19. And I'll represent to you that this was sent to me all at once, stapled. Um, could you identify that for me, please? It appears to be a copy of uh, the bills essentially surrounding the care that I have ordered or uh, recommended for Mr. Lunsford, um, and it's outlined on the first page. And that has um, MFG spine, which is uh, your practice. Means. And okay. so that is um, the, the two surgeries, the charge for the anterior lumbar fusion, and the charge for the single level cervical disc replacement. And that's $83,235.26, correct? Correct. St. Louis Spine Orthopedic Surgery Center, that's the building we're in now, correct? That's, that's correct. Okay. Is the surgery center in here as well? No, the St. Louis Spine Orthopedic Surgery Center is the okay. facility where his procedures, his two operations were performed. That's 121000 That would include the implants uh, regarding uh, that. So he has that. Pain and rehab specialist is for his injections. He, remember, he had two sets, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a total of uh, 1,259 and 4,860. His MRIs, remember, he's MRIs of his neck and back on multiple occasions. That comes to 9,620. He's had two CT myelograms. He's had CT scans to evaluate his fusion and his neck post-surgery to evaluate what we call heterotopic ossification. And that comes to 22,558 for all those CTs. West County Care Center is a facility that is an overnight stay facility. Um, and so that charges $2,133. The Orthopedic Center of St. Louis is the assistant charges 
um, uh, for the two surgeries, and that comes to 30605 And all the treatment we've discussed and that you just discussed going through the billing, um, is it your opinion that all that treatment is reasonable and necessary to treat Joe for his injuries? I believe so, and I think his results justify that. Okay. And these, these billing amounts, these are reasonable and customary amounts, uh, reasonable and necessary amounts uh, for Joe's treatment? Yes. Uh, we talked a little bit about his ER visit. Yes. Um, and an ER bill of $5,476, uh, which included uh, two CTs and emergency room care. Is that reasonable and necessary? Yes, that would be appropriate after an accident such as this. And remember I said earlier, uh, oftentimes the ER will do CT scans because of the rapid nature. That's exactly what they did. Okay. And then uh, pain management, physical therapy with uh, the Center for Interventional Pain Management for a few months. Um, and that's been marked for identification as Joe's bills, uh, 24 and 25. Um, is his treatment of pain management and physical therapy for those months after his crash reasonable and necessary? Yes, I think, again, this is conservative care. This would be typical for therapy, trigger point injections, other types of injections. So that was reasonable and necessary bills in line with that type of treatment. Yes. Um, and then you also told us earlier that you sent Joe to um, Apex Physical Therapy. Yes. And that was to help him recover from his first surgery, is that right? That's correct. And he was treated um, with Apex Physical Therapy. <clears throat> and I'll show you the bill, Doctor. They've been marked for identification as... So the Apex Physical Therapy bill marked for identification is exhibit 9 for what looks like about two months of physical therapy to help him recover from his surgery. Uh, is that reasonable and necessary? Yes. As well as the billing amount reasonable necessary. Yes. Okay, and that bill amount of seven thousand nine hundred sixty-six dollars and seventy cents. That's correct. And then uh, we talked about a little bit before that when he came to you, he had uh, he already had some MRIs. I believe you saw the reports. I had the images also. Um, and those MRIs were taken at Hampton Open MRI. Looks like we had a, a lumbar without contrast, and then we also had a uh, an MRI of the cervical spine. Uh, right. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And those are, were reasonable and necessary for his treatment? I thought so, yes, sir. Okay. And uh, the lumbar uh, MRI without contrast at $2,667, is that reasonable and necessary? Yes. Okay, same question for the uh, the cervical MRI. Uh, that was $3,325.55, is that reasonable and necessary? Yes, sir. And those two um, bills were exhibits Joe's Bills 28 for the lumbar MRI and Joe's Bill 29 for the uh, cervical. Yes. You mark for, we mark for identification as Exhibit 1. Is that your current CV? Yes, sir. Okay, so that's up to date and accurate as of today? Yes, sir. Exhibits 2, 3, 4, 5. So if we go through them, Exhibit 2 is an AP view similar to what you've already uh, stated as a rendering that would assist. That's an AP view of the lumbar spine showing the cages. Okay. Exhibit 3 is a lateral view, but it's a full lateral view of the cages in the lumbar spine. That one you did discuss. Uh, five you discussed. Five we discussed. Mm -hmm. I believe we discussed uh, seven, which is also uh, illustrated of the tear in the disc at C5-6. Exhibit eight is the tear in the seven. disc in the lumbar spine. And exhibit uh, four here is a, what we call a cone down view. It shows it more in projectin. Uh, uh, this uh, the lumbar spine. Exhibit six is an AP view of the cervical spine in the disc replacement looking from the front as opposed to the side. Okay. And these are all fair and accurate depictions of, uh, of Joe's spine? They are x-rays, so they are the, the real thing. So we talked a little bit before, Doctor, about um, adjacent level failure at both the, uh, the lower back and the cervical spine. Correct. So adjacent level failure, um, that's the but the increased risk of surgery or increased risk of injury or failure at the adjacent levels, correct? I think that's, a, again, what we're saying is if this is solid or this doesn't move as well, you're going to have more problems at the area above it and the more problems at the area below it. So when that fails, that is an adjacent level failure to the index surgery. That's how we describe it as surgeons. And so in his lumbar spine, uh, again, we talked about that. I talked about the issues in the cervical spine. Okay. Um, let's talk about the lower back first. Um, the adjacent level failure, 
potential in the lower back. What's uh, so he's at an increased risk for future surgery in his lower back. Is that right? Correct. Tell us about that increased risk. What is the likelihood? And then um, what would the surgery be in the future? Sure. Well, what I would say is, is for him, having a um, future surgery in his low back, uh, the longer he lives, approaches, <laughs> I won't say it's ever a statistical certainty, but approaches that. Uh, we know from looking at fusions like that, in his young age, uh, he will wear out the adjacent segments and it becomes again, probably crosses over more probable than not uh, around 10 to 15 years for him, probably around 10 years is when most people would say. The, the treatment is, is either a fusion such as the one we described, and you already know the costs associated with that. The alternative for him is if his joints don't fail in the back and it's just his disc, I may consider doing an artificial disc there. The artificial disc is similar charges, but uh, surgeon fee and assistant fee is about 60000 Surgery center fee and implant cost, because the implants are a little more costly, is about 60000 for that. And that's at one level. Obviously, he could have both levels fail, so you would just determine that appropriately. But and that's just in the lower back. That's in the lower back. Okay. Um, so those would the, that's the spectrum of failure that we would expect. Those are generally how I would handle that failure, uh, and I think those charges are, are um, reasonable for that. What would, Doctor, what's the likelihood um, of it being just one level as opposed to two levels uh, above and below? That's an interesting question. I don't know if we know that completely. What I would say is, is, for instance, if I have to do a fusion at the adjacent level, then the likelihood he'll fail at the lower level, let's say I have to fuse the upper level, likelihood of fail at the lower level is almost certain. So some of that will be depend on what we have to do. Um, but what we can say is, again, this is a gentleman that will encounter an adjacent level failure in his lifetime. That is almost certain. Uh, but you can't predict whether it'll be uh, one level or two. And the only way you would say that for sure the second level would be involved within a reasonable degree of medical certainty is if your second surgery was a fusion surgery, then for sure it would cause the other level to fail. Given his age, of, as of today, he's 38 years old, um, so he's looking at at least another 40, 50 years of life, if not longer, uh, would you say it's more likely true than not true that he's going to need adjacent level surgery in his lower back? Oh, in his low back, I'm, I feel very comfortable. There's no question he's going to avoid that bullet coming at him. Okay. Is it more likely true than not true that he'll have two adjacent surgeries in his lower back in his lifetime? No. I don't want to say that. What I would say is I think he's at increased risk for a second surgery, but I don't want to say at this point um, some of that would be depending on the failure, as I've already said. So I, I feel very comfortable saying for sure he will require at least one adjacent level surgery, and I've outlined the possibilities. The only thing I could say is if that adjacent level surgery is a fusion, then almost certainly he will require another adjacent level surgery. Okay. Because now he'll have two levels locked in his back, and that will happen. It's almost a certain here. It's definitely more likely true than not true. He's going to need at least one additional surgery in his lower back in his lifetime. Correct and he's at increased risk for a second one. That's correct. And, and a lot of that risk will be dependent on what the second surgery is. Can we do a disc replacement or can we do a fusion? Okay. And what will be some of the factors, um, without getting too much into it, of whether or not he would need a disc replacement or he could do a disc replacement or it would have to be a fusion? Again, if his only his disc fails and his joints are okay, I would prefer to do a disc replacement. If his joints are failing, also structurally, then he has to have a fusion because you don't want to preserve motion when you have bad joints. So some of that will be, again, what we can say is he will require this treatment, but then it becomes a spectrum and you can't tell which pipeline he's going to go into. That's why I can't give you exact answers. We can only say he's heading in this direction, but he may head here, here, or here. Okay. So, Dr., I want to talk to you about adjacent level failure then for the neck or cervical okay. spine. Do you believe, what, are, what do you believe the chances are of him needing an adjacent level surgery in his neck in his lifetime given his age of 38 years old? I believe it, because of his young age, it will still probably occur, but it will be much slower. Because we're preserving motion, uh, his failure rate will go more like 15 plus years before we start to see that. 
Um, we're already at seven years in our clinical trials, and we're already seeing upwards of uh, 20 plus percent of revision surgeries either at the index or operative level or the adjacent level. So uh, there, we know that this is a statistical march, just like if um, any person's had a knee replacement or a hip replacement, we know that those structures can wear out over time. Revision surgery is again part of life. Um, we're not perfect, but the cervical operation is a much better uh, pathway for him. Okay. <clears throat> Given his age, would you do you believe it's more likely true than not true he'll need adjacent level surgery in his neck in his lifetime? Yes. Okay. And adjacent level surgery in his neck at one level or two levels? Again, I would I feel very comfortable saying at one level at this point the cost of that would be essentially identical to what he's already had. Um, it, it is it is possible that he would require removal of his disc replacement and a fusion of this operative level, but that's less likely. So I think the what I can say within a reasonable degree of medical certainty is I believe he will require one additional disc replacement as a direct result of this procedure. Okay. And the treatment you've testified to, doctor, as treatment that you believe is reasonable and necessary as a result of the car crash and the injuries resulting from that. And the surgeries we performed, yes, yes sir. <clears throat> And those injuries, again, you believe more likely than not, uh, he suffered from the car crash? Yes, I think we stated that already. The medical costs you've testified to, both the past costs and the future costs, that those are costs are reasonable and necessary? Yes, I've stated that. Okay. And all of your conclusions and opinions that you've given me are within a reasonable degree of medical certainty? I've done my best today to do that, yes, sir. And I don't have any other questions, doctor. I appreciate your time. Dr. Gornett, my name is Kyle Railer. I represent uh, Mr. Yount and Christian Environmental Services. We've not met before, have we? I don't believe so. Uh, and, okay. In this case, uh, the plaintiff is represented by uh, Mr. Ben Sansone. Uh, did you know Mr. Sansone before this case? I have um, uh, treated, I'd say, two or three of his clients in the past. Uh, I've probably given um, uh, depositions um, on cases that he is an attorney, um, that I would say two, three, or four times in total that I can recall. Um, I don't know him personally. Have you? The first time you saw the plaintiff was August 15, 2014. Yes, sir. And at that point, uh, is it your practice to ask the patient uh, how he came to be at your office or who referred him to you? Yes, we will often do that. Okay. And do you remember uh, Mr. Yount telling you that, excuse me, do you remember Mr. Lunsford telling you that he was uh, referred to you by Mr. Sansom? No, I don't recall that, but if whatever Mr. Lunsford would say, he would know who referred him. So I've treated many patients of um, Dr. Pott in the past, so I, I just don't know. So whatever he would say would be the accurate response. And were you made aware he was being treated for injuries in a motor vehicle accident? Well, I think that was very clear from the very beginning, yes, sir. That's what it told me. Uh, we talked about the treatment that you provided for him and the, the billing associated with it. Um, do you know if uh, any of those bills have, in fact, been paid? Uh, I don't know whether there are any credits to the account. I can certainly find that out through the billing service PMBA. Um, I, I don't know that as we sit here right now. Do you have the, that exhibit in front of you? Uh, okay. I think I Okay. You're looking at the unmarked copy of Joe's bills 001 through 0019, correct? Yes, this just reflects charges uh, on the account. I don't see uh, any credits, so again, I can't make a statement based on this, whether any credits were applied, whether he made personal payments. Um, so, uh, Dur during the course of your treatment of a patient, uh, as it relates to your billing, do you 
accept less than the amount billed as full satisfaction of the amount owed for treatment? What I would say is I am not, because I, I, again, I'm a, I don't want to say this in an egotistical way, but I'm a world authority on disc replacement, these type of spinal fusions. And so I'm out of network on all insurance. I accept insurance, I accept, but if Blue Cross tells me that these glasses are 10 cents and I just paid $10 at Walgreens, I'm not going to accept the 10 cents. So my charges are my charges. Um, I will accept insurance as a credit, but my bill is my bill, and that's what we expect uh, payment for. Okay, so our thing we routinely do. Let's talk. Uh, <clears throat> about the injuries that Mr. Lunsford sustained and just to be clear uh, there was some discussion about uh, x-rays and, and bony abnormalities and, and, and I believe your testimony was that there was no injury to the bones or the vertebrae of the back, is that correct? That would be my opinion, yes sir. I think he just injured the disc and disc mechanism. I don't believe he had a fracture. I don't believe, uh, again, uh, there was any displacement in the bones or joints. I, I, I felt that those remained intact structurally. It was only the soft tissue disc that sits between the bones that was injured. And similarly, you did not find any nerve impingement either at the lumbar level or at the cervical level. Well, what I would say is, <clears throat> I didn't feel that this was an injury that caused significant nerve impingement or nerve function abnormalities. This is more of, again, the way I would explain it is more like a torn cartilage in your knee than it is a massive herniation causing you to be paralyzed. This is a structural injury. Um, and so that's how I would try to categorize it to people. So we did not treat him because of nerve function abnormalities. We did not treat him because of nerve impingement. And I wanted him to understand that too. And so you see that alluded to in the notes. With respect to the lumbar fusion that you performed, that's a very common orthopedic procedure? Fusion is a common spine procedure. An anterior lumbar fusion, I would say, is not particularly common because you have to approach the person from the front. Most spine surgeons are not trained to do that. Uh, they would require a vascular surgeon or someone to come in and do that. Uh, my training was fortunate enough that I, I was trained to do all those exposures, so I do that myself. And, and so that procedure um, I wouldn't say is particularly common in this community. Uh, the cervical disc replacement one I think now is becoming more common because of the outstanding results from cervical disc replacement. So I would say that is a much more common neurosurgical or orthopedic spine procedure. Okay, and we'll talk about the cervical procedure uh, in a minute, but just for the moment I'd like to focus on the lumbar okay. uh, procedure. What you told me then is that what's not common about it is the approach. You used an anterior approach. Is that right? That's not something that uh, a, a spine surgeon generally in this community does on their own like I do. Uh, the approach, I don't, I don't, most people approach the spine from the back side. Um, and so I would say that's generally how most spine surgeons in this community would do a fusion on a patient. And could this fusion have been accomplished from the back side? Sure. It's just like fusion. Think about it. You can glue something on the front, you can glue it on the back, or you can glue it on the front and back. But if you think about it, if it, the results, in my opinion, would not be as good because Mr. Lundford now has improvement in his structural back pain and I never cut on his back. That's what makes this so much better for him because I haven't messed up his muscles. I haven't done anything to his back side. If you do things on the backside, your your chance of having an adjacent level failure go way up because your your even your implants and all that are very close to the adjacent level structure. So this is a better operation. It, can it be done from the back? Absolutely. Okay. And so whether it's from an anterior approach or a rear approach coming from the back, 
lumbar fusion surgery as a general proposition is a common orthopedic procedure? I think it's common for spine surgeons. I wouldn't say orthopedics, but I would say for spine surgeons, neurosurgeons, and orthopedic spine surgeons, yes, I think it is something they do routinely. Yes, sir. And if you had to ballpark it, how many times have you performed that kind of a procedure, whether it be anterior or coming from the back? I couldn't tell you, but I know in our database we probably have at least uh, 1,000 to 2,000 uh, procedures such as that. And is that a procedure which you've had a high rate of success in performing? I think so. I think so, and he's representative of that. I mean, I, I felt comfortable I was going to help him. He had a little bit of a complication with the subsidence, but other than that, I mean, his result has been remarkable. He's very pleased. Is lumbar spine surgery, or to be more specific, a fusion surgery, something that may be required in some instances, even in the absence of a trauma or an accident? Sure, you can require a fusion for stabilization or structural intervention if you, for instance, say you have to decompress too much or remove too much of the bone, that can cause you to need to do a fusion independent of an accident. Um, so there are other reasons why you would do uh, fusions on patient. It doesn't always have to be related to a trauma or an accident. Okay, what are the other reasons why you might require a fusion other than an accident? Well, you could have some structural problems that you were born with or developed as a young age, what we call a spondylolisthesis. Uh, that's a common thing. You could have uh, spinal stenosis that requires decompression. That usually results in much more aged people than what we're dealing with here, but they can get stenosis and that requires decompression and some type of stabilization. Those are the most common reasons. What about just disc degeneration? Can that be a reason why someone might require a fusion procedure? I think it is possible, but usually disc degeneration does not cause a need for that. It's usually disc degeneration in conjunction with some trauma because degeneration is a normal part of life. Another reason why you would do a fusion is scoliosis, so that's commonly done for what we call deformities of the spine. Okay. Now, uh, in Joe's case, uh, the procedure was performed where? Uh, at St. Louis Spine Orthopedic Surgery Center. And was he kept overnight? Yes, I believe he was either kept overnight there or he went to uh, West County Care Center, which is a skilled nursing facility. And what's the purpose of them being kept overnight following the procedure? Well, obviously they have implants, which we've already shown, and um, in the lumbar spine, you, you were down where your intestines are, you need to monitor them so that they you know, do that. They usually have a catheter in place into their bladder, so he has a catheter overnight. Um, and so we watch that. The most important thing is he gets antibiotics. The next morning in his lumbar spine, if he's able to urinate, uh, walk around, and take liquids, then he can go home. And in his case, uh, that's in fact what happened, correct? Yes, yes, he did very well. <clears throat> and so when we, talked, when we talked earlier about some of the risks of surgery, uh, none of those came to happen or came to be in Joe's case, right? The only risk that we discussed that came about a little member was the sinking into the cages, but I don't believe that that necessarily had a big impact on his outcome. He did very well. So he did not have any major complications. He did very well with his surgery. And you can see by my notes, he's very pleased with the result. Um, following the surgery, um, you followed up with him for several visits. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the purpose of the follow-ups is, uh, in general, to see how well the uh, surgery doing. Is, is doing, yes. right? So not only we, we get the patient outcomes, so the patient grades the result. We look at the clinical how we would do it, so we examine him, we take x-rays, and we measure that. And then we guide him along on that process of recovery, which is typical of any operation. And, you know, we don't need to go through, revisit all of the uh, visits, but there are a couple things I, I just want to uh, 
make specific reference to. Sure. So <clears throat> the surgery is on March 25th, 2015. There yes, are a, it appears to be at least one or two follow-ups before you see him on July 13th, 2015. Yes, sir. And as of July 13, 2015, <clears throat> you're saying you described that there's excellent position of the fusion device. Is that correct? Um, July 13th, uh, July 30th of 2015. No, July 13th is what I'm. Okay, July 13th. Okay, okay, I got the note here. Under the clinical findings. I thought his devices were excellent. Remember, I said there's the same slight subsidence as mentioned in there, but no real change from his original films of 5, 11, 15. So I thought everything looked good. And you said the CT scan reveals good early bone consolidation. What do you mean by that? Well, the best appearance I would give the jury is, you know, if you put some glue on the table, you can see whether the glue is hardening or not. So what I'm looking at on CT is, is that hardening? Is there any rim around the cages that would represent motion? Everything looked good. You're wanting it to, you're looking for good fusion. Yes, sir. And, and the early CT was representative that he was healing well. Yes, sir. And that continued throughout all of the imaging that you saw. Yes, sir. So we could say definitively at one year, he was healed. No question about it, by CT and by x-ray. And when you say healed, you mean the he bone is, is fused solid. as solidly as you expect it to be? Well, it continues to remodel, but I'm not worried that he didn't go on to heal. I, don't, I think there was zero chance at that point. Uh, his healing by CT scan was unquestionable, solid. Uh, he could load that. He's not going to hurt that fusion. Um, on the impression section for your July 15th, I'm sorry, July 13, 2015 visit, you said his exam shows 5-5 five, five strength in all groups. What does that mean? Normal strength. Normal, the 5 out of 5, what are you measuring? Well, in his lower extremities, what we do is measure what's called EHL, ankle dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, his quads, is adductor. So what basically happens is five or five strength, it would just take the biceps because we do it in upper extremities too. If I pull in your biceps and I can't break that biceps, I'm pulling as hard as I can, that's five or five. Let's say in someone like you, your muscular guy, I can just break it a little bit and it bends a little bit, that's four over five. Three over five is I can hold it up against gravity, but if any pressure on it, it'll fall. Two over five is I can't even hold it against gravity, but if I take gravity out of play, I can still move it. One over five is just a little flicker, so it'll just flicker. And that's how we grade strength. That's an objective measure of strength. And so his strength was at five out of five, which is the best score you can normal. get. I'd go further, I'd say it's normal. The next visit we see is July 30th, 2015. That's correct, yes sir. <clears throat> and this was uh, after an automobile accident, is that right? Yes. What did he report to you about the automobile accident? Uh, let's see, he uh, stated he was in his normal course of health. He was approached rapidly driving down a road as a driver. Apparently a driver had a tail light that was up and had his brake lights on. He was sitting in the middle of the road. Uh, there was no obvious parking. He, apparently this other driver was disoriented, apparently was under some treatment for cancer. Um, and uh, he approached him rapidly, he realized he was stopped, not turning, and I think he swerved to avoid striking that car in the road. Um, the front of the driver's side of his car was struck by a trailer that was passing by. Um, and at that point, when I saw him, he had increased back pain to both sides. In the clinical findings, um, it appears you looked at the films and, and were able to determine that the collision did not change the position of the cages. That's correct. Everything looked good. 
Again, clearly something like that could flare up your symptoms. There's no question about that. But remember, we had already looked at his adjacent discs. At that point, they were healthy. So this is something that, for the most part, I thought he, he probably had a temporary flare-up of his back pain. Um, and so I told him I gave him reassurance. I thought he would be fine. And clinically, ultimately, he was fine. There was no real issues or change in treatment as a result of this accident. But clearly, it flared his symptoms a little bit. We reported a neck pain. Looks like the next visit was September 28, 2015. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and again, uh, he has a uh, five five strength in all groups yes sir and you performed a ct scan that again showed good bone consolidation yes so he's progressing well and based on that progression his recovery i thought he was capable of returning to work full duty no restrictions and let's talk about that um as an orthopedic surgeon are you often called upon to determine a patient's capacity to return to work yes and full work duty is not the same for everyone depending upon what they do, isn't it? That's correct. For example, someone who's got a sedentary position might be able to, tr to return to full work duty sooner than someone who's a laborer. Fair? I think that's fair. And again, full duty for a sedentary person is different than an iron worker. So I think that that's all. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you point that out because I think sometimes that's misapplied so I think you're absolutely correct so when you return someone to work full duty and say you're ready to return to work full duty you're taking into consideration the specific type of work that the person does so yes I considered that on him yes sir. Okay. and in this case so you considered the fact that mr. Uh, Lunsford works as a lineman yes and you felt he was capable of performing all of the duties associated with lineman work, uh, or at least he'd re, re, he'd had a sufficient uh, improvement that he could do that. I felt that he was ready to give that a try. Yes, he again he has a little bit more protection because I think I, I could be wrong in this, but I think he owns his own business. But I felt that he was ready to give a try of going back full duty. Yes, sir. And he didn't express any reservation in, in returning to full duty. Well, I would say that. I think everybody is concerned about it, but I felt he was ready. His, his, he had had a very good clinical result, as all the notes indicated. His strength was normal, and he shows good bone consolidation. So at this point, we're moving forward. I, feel, I had no reservation, and part of my job as being his doctor is to give him confidence that he can go ahead and move forward and try this. It also says I've given him a six-month temporary permit for hunting with a crossbow. Do you, do you see that? Yes. Do you, as a as a doctor, issue uh, hunting permits? <laughs> no, but I I have to fill out the form. So in this situation, um, remember he has neck issues, and I did not want him to, uh, you know, pull a bow or something like that. I think he was a bow hunter, so a crossbow allows him to not put so much stress on his upper body, and I felt that that was appropriate. And you thought he would be capable of doing that, hunting with a crossbow without causing any potential uh, complications to his surgery. Again, if a gentleman is at full duty, no restrictions, I have no problem letting him live their life. Because again, part of understanding this is, does the problem impact their life enough that we need to do more? If I put him in a 4x4 four four padded room, he's never going to know how he's doing. In this situation, I felt he was doing re really well. He felt he was doing well. Is he perfect at this point? No. That's why I gave him these options. But he was ready to go to full duty. And I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. What, what we have here is a patient who's had a, a lumbar fusion surgery, and you've treated many people with that kind of a uh, procedure, true? Yes. And those type of people go through a period of uh, uh, recuperation, and we've talked some about uh, Mr. Lunsford's period of recuperation, haven't we? Yes. Uh, but upon completing that period of recuperation, uh, someone with a lumbar fusion surgery can return to, uh, generally speaking, uh, a normal life. Is that true? Well, I guess normal is a loaded question. What's normal? What I would say is, 
can I get someone like this and, and do we feel comfortable? Yes, but remember, this is what I do. I'm this expert on neck and back pain. My expectation is he returned to work full duty. He did that. He, I think he's very satisfied with his result. And so I don't think I ever get him back to his normal life, but this is good. He's, for the most part, he's got his family life back. He's got his job back. His pain is controlled. Remember, initially I saw him, he's on narcotics, he's off narcotics. So this is a very good result. Um, I don't want to, again, act like we're perfect, because we're not, and as soon as I do that, God's going to strike me down. But that being said, this is a good result. Right, and so just to be more specific as it relates to Mr. Lunsford, some of the things that he does is he hunts and he fishes, um, and... Um, he likes to work on cars. Those are the sort of things that we know Mr. Lunchford enjoys doing. I trust there's nothing about his lumbar fusion procedure that you believe would prevent him from doing those things. What I would say is no, I, I wouldn't prevent him from doing anything. He's at full duty, no restrictions. What I would say is prolonged activities. For instance, say he's working on a car and he has to bend over or do something for a prolonged period of time. That's going to bother him more now than it ever did before. Can he work on a car? Sure. But again, vigorous type of activities where you're in awkward positions. If you think about it, my torso, because I'm fat and chubby, but I, it, my torso probably weighs 100 pounds. When I lean over, that, that's like holding a 100 pound weight like this against your body. So it puts tremendous stresses. He'll notice that when he does that, or maybe before he did. But would I encourage him to go uh, hunt, fish, play ball with his kids, um, work on cars? Sure, because that's what quality of life is all about. And he should be capable of doing that, although he might experience additional pain associated with it. That's correct. Okay. And that's the permanent symptoms we talked about. It appears that um, the next visit would have been January 4th of 2016. Yes, sir. Uh, and we will, in the interest of time, skip past that to the, the next visit, which appears to be April 4th, 2016. Yes, sir. And at this point, you are now uh, a full year out from surgery? Yes. And at that point, uh, I think you told us the the fusion is solid. solid. Yes, sir. And as it relates to this condition of creating strain at a level above or a level below, on the imaging as of April of 2016, are you seeing any signs of that? No, sir. And it appears to me that, in general, in 2016, the focus of the treatment shifted from the lumbar spine to the cervical spine. Is that fair? Yes. The cervical spine was, again, compared to his low back, was never as bad of an issue. It was present, but he was trying to, the lumbar spine initially was much more of a big deal for him. But the cervical spine continued, again, we, we treated conservatively for a long time, tried to avoid surgery, but it, it just keeps flaring its head. And, you know, given what we knew, I, I was very confident I could help him. So finally, you just hit a point where, look, let's fix this and be done so you can move on with your life and not have to come here and get injections and things like that. And you tried the injections and those failed, and that's what ultimately led to the decision to make to do surgery initially i think they really helped him more but it kept wearing off it kept wearing off but yes i think in, in a nutshell that's correct i think you're correct and let's talk a little bit more in detail about what you did at the cervical level yes sir uh you uh inserted a artificial disc yes sir the prestige st yes sir that's correct and the 
artificial disk is meant to function just like a real disk, is it not? Well, that, that, that's what we try to design it to do. <laughs> Again, I wouldn't say it functions like a normal disk, but what I would say is we are getting better and better at approaching more normal motion. We haven't hit it yet, so there's continued development, but uh, I think we're getting closer. Can you quantify the difference between the motion provided by the artificial disk versus uh, the man-made, what we're born with disk? Actually, I can because we've done that research. Um, the cervical disc replacement he had does not uh, return your, your, your spine motion back to normal. We look at uh, asymptomatic uh, controls, and this is some of the research we do with medical metrics. And it still is, to the best of my recollection, um, about two standard deviations below normal. Now, what I would tell you with that is that actually may be normal for a post-operative patient. Uh, there is one disc that approaches close to normal, and that is a Moby C disc. Unfortunately, the Moby C disc has more complications, and some part is felt to be because it has more motion. So, uh, the prestige does not approach you back to normal, and uh, we have data, at least internally, that would support that. And so, even though the artificial disc is intended to provide motion, uh, you still are of the opinion, nevertheless, that it creates additional stresses on the levels above and below the artificial disc. Is that right? Yes, the quality of that motion is not normal. There's also other reasons that I didn't discuss that could cause increased stress. Approximately um, uh, anywhere from 20 to 70 percent of discs, depending on the manufacturer, develop what's called HO or heterotopic ossification. What that does is the bone grows around the disc as a response to the disc and locks the disc in place and that converts it to a fusion. If you're converted to a fusion, we've already discussed that that dramatically accelerates your adjacent level problem. So there's grades of that. There's grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. We're actually involved in a publication looking at all the HO uh, for all the discs. Right now, what I would say is at his one year fall, he did not have significant HO that I saw on his CT. So that's a good thing. But again, we're also doing 10 year fall where there's a much more substantial uh, HO. So this develops over time. It's a bony response. We see that in artificial hips. We see it in artificial knees. Uh, and we see it in the lumbar spine and artificial discs also. So with respect to the disc replacement procedure, where was that done? And that was also done at St. Louis Spine Orthopedic Surgery Center this year. And would he have been released outpatient? Or? No, sir. We would always keep him overnight just for antibiotics. When you put an implant like that in, the last thing you want is an infection. That's a disaster. So always uh, he will get overnight stay, uh, 24 hours of antibiotics. This procedure is one that I think you talked about earlier, though, is one that you would agree is a common procedure. I think now it is. Uh, remember, I was on the original clinical trials, but uh, now I think it is commonplace because it has such good results. And as far as the recovery time uh, before someone's back to where they were, again, appreciating that they may not, they now have a artificial disc, but subject to that, the recovery time is, is also substantially shorter with a uh, replacement disc, correct? Yes, and you can see that in the chart. He actually returns to work in a higher level of function full duty much more rapidly than he did with his lumbar fusion. So you're absolutely correct in that. And the, uh, the clinical trials support that, um, the, that there's earlier return to work for patients with cervical disc replacement compared to cervical fusion. 
with respect to uh, yourself, how regularly are you performing a disc replacement procedure? <laughs> Very regularly. I, 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 I believe I probably perform more cervical disc replacements than any physician in the United States. But I'm the guy that writes all the papers. I'm the author of the largest prospective randomized clinical trial at one level, two levels. Um, we have, again, five papers we just submitted last week on cervical disc replacement. So I do a lot. Um, so I would say I do, on average, at least several patients a week with disc replacements. Okay. Uh, so again, let's look at uh, the post-surgical sure. outcomes. The surgery was on July 13th, 2016. Yes, sir. And it appears that you saw him for the first time after that on August 8th, 2016. Yes. And at that point, uh, he, you uh, are reporting that he has had a remarkable result. Is that yes. Right? Yes, I, he's doing great. I mean, his headaches, neck pain are improving. He, he can tell a huge difference. He, he's happy. An exam shows 5-5 five, five strength is reported. Normal strength. And the strength that you're testing when you're dealing with the C5-6 is what? Well, upper extremities. So we would do biceps, triceps, wrist, dorsiflexion, bowler flexion, grip, intrinsics. Those are generally what I test. And at that point, uh, you are already returning him to work, but at light duty. Yes, sir. So this is within... Three weeks. Three weeks of surgery. Yes, sir. Okay. And at six weeks, I returned him full duty. Uh, except what day for the is climbing. that? The six-week one was on 9-8-16. Okay. But I put that restriction on the climbing. Remember, I talked about the, the pulling and stuff. I didn't want him climbing poles. But other than that, he could do everything else. So he, he could be in, you know, heavy stuff. I just don't want him climbing because uh, I thought that was bad. But then at 12, 5, 16, which is his three-month visit, then I took those restrictions off. He's now at full duty, no restrictions. Okay, and so let's talk about that full sure. duty, no work restrictions. Uh, much like the, the lumbar surgery, there, there's nothing about this cervical procedure that would pre preclude him from engaging in the activities that Joe Lunsford did before the accident. Is that true? That's true. And I would say the cervical surgery is better than lumbar surgery. So, uh, again, this is something that is an extremely good operation. It would require no restrictions uh, for this once he heals up. And he healed up, and again, I placed him on no restrictions. The last time that you saw him was July 20th, 2017? Yes, sir. And at that point, you released him from treatment. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. I would tell him that, for lack of a better term, he's at maximum medical improvement, but I would follow up him as needed or if he desires long term. So because of all these disc replacements we do, if the patient wants to enter in long-term follow-up, then I'll see him at two years, five years, seven years, ten years, just like we do with our FDA clinical trials. In between that time, even though he won't come in, our uh, research department will send him an outcome survey, for instance, at three years and four years, six years, eight years, nine years. So all the in-between times he will get and fill out surveys by mail or by internet actually now. I want to make sure I understand your uh, opinions about adjacent level failure. And let's first talk about the, the lumbar spine. Uh, I take it you're, you're pretty confident that at least there'll be, there will be a failure at least at at least one level. Is that right? Yes, I feel very confident in that. Yes, sir. As to a second level. Is it accurate to say your opinion is that he's at an increased risk for uh, 
a failure at a second level? The way I would say it is, is this. I'm not comfortable saying that he will develop a double level failure within a reasonable degree of medical certainty. I'm totally comfortable saying he will develop one. Unless the failure at the one level requires a fusion, then he will certainly develop a double level failure. So, and that's what I can't tell you. It's a spectrum. Right. And so, so just to be very clear, because you don't know what that failure might be, as we sit here today, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, you cannot say he will have a double level failure. Objection. What I would say is right now I feel comfortable stating within a reasonable degree of medical certainty he will require one operation and right now I've given you the spectrum uh, either a fusion or a, a disc replacement. If it is a fusion then I feel comfortable stating he will require a second operation at the adjacent level but I can't tell you whether it would be a fusion or disc replacement at the first adjacent level and so that's how I would say it because we just don't know what's going to happen in the future. I don't, I cannot say within a reasonable degree of medical certainty whether he will have facet failure or only disc failure. So I've given a perspective of how that would be. And I don't, that's as accurate as I can be. Okay. Now, uh, with respect to the cervical level, mm Is it your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that he will have a failure at a level above or below the cervical disc replacement? Yes. And I believe that that would probably be, again, another disc replacement. Those are the costs that we talk about. That's generally the failure. He is young enough that I feel comfortable he's probably going to not, in his earlier stages, need a fusion. Now, is it possible that his facets wear out over the longer term? Absolutely. But in this shorter term of, um, you know, 15 years, I'm looking at an adjacent level disc failure. And beyond an adjacent level disc failure where you would presumably treat it with another disc replacement, you're not prepared to offer any additional opinions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Is that true? I think that's a fair statement, yes, sir. When you last saw Mr. Lunchford, was he on any prescription pain medication? He better not be. <laughs> okay. He better not be. No, I'm a big stickler. Is this a person who treats neck and back pain? I, I would not operate on him if he was taking narcotics. I'm sorry, I may have said that wrong. The last time you saw him. Right. So what, what I'm saying is... It, he he needs to be off narcotics or not that if he has a significant pain problem that isn't handled by anti-inflammatory pain type medicines then he needs to get in to see me and so I do not believe in giving narcotics out for structural back pain or neck pain if you have that much of a problem we need to figure out what the problem is and fix it uh, because narcotics only lead to dependence worsening pain and so forth so I'm a pretty big stickler on that he was representative of that. He's followed those instructions. He's off narcotics per my request. And uh, again, I would not want him to ever take narcotics. If he's having a problem for that, he needs to get back in the city. Okay. And so the last time he would have been on that medication would have been? Preoperatively for the back surgery long, long time ago. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. That is correct. And um, when, we, when you started treating... Mr. Lunchford, what was your goal? My goal was for him to get his life back. I mean, and, and I think we've done that. And I guess that's where I was going to go with that. Uh, <clears throat> did you provide him with all the clinically indicated treatment? Yeah, I think his treatment's been excellent. I think his results have been excellent. I mean, we all hear of, you know, horror stories. I mean, he's had an excellent result in his neck and back. I think he would state that he had an excellent result. And you believe you provided him with uh, a very high quality of care? Oh, yes, absolutely. And uh, I think you've said this many times, but to just you would you agree that you, the lumbar fusion was a success? Yes. And the cervical disc replacement was a success? I would go further. I would say that not only do I believe that, I would say Mr. Lunsford believes that. I believe his family believes that. And so you believe you met your goals that you set for yourself when you started treating him? 
I think so, yes, sir. I think that's a fair statement. I have no further questions. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Just a couple follow-ups, Doc. You were asked that, I believe it was in, in the uh, April 4, 2016 follow-up, that you saw there was there was no indication of adjacent level failure. Um, <clears throat> the adjacent level failure we were talking about, you know, puts them in an increased risk for future surgery. You wouldn't expect to see that for 5, 10, 15 years or more, right? That's correct, yes, sir. So year out, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't expect to see it. You don't want to see it. You always have to comment on it. But at this point, he does not have an adjacent level failure. He has no radiographic evidence to support he's currently having an adjacent level failure. That is annular tears were the result of degenerative disc disease as opposed to a car crash. That's, let, let's be clear. All disc injuries, whether it's a herniation, annular tear, are always seen with some level of degeneration. Well, why? Because that makes the disc a little bit weaker. Does Mr. Lunsford have some subtle disc degeneration in his lumbar spine? Yeah, it's age appropriate. That's not an issue. What causes annular tear was this accident. It was not degeneration. The disc doesn't spontaneously tear on its own. This was related to the accident. Same question for the uh, cervical spine surgery where you put the, uh, the disc replacement. What's the likelihood of a revision surgery in his lifetime? He's at definite increased risk. I don't know if I gave you the exact number at this point, but um, uh, reoperation rates at seven years on the clinical trials that we've done are around between adjacent levels, revisions, removals, are probably already at 20 plus percent at seven years. Okay. Do you have any data for further out than seven years? No, no. I'm, I'm, okay. that's just, and I'm, I'm the author of one of the publications in seven years, so I can tell you that what we see is it's a gradual progression like this. And so it's a statistical. Um, issue no different than artificial knees or artificial hips. A certain percentage per year will require revision surgery. Okay. Would you be able to give us any estimate, in your opinion, of what the likelihood of him needing a revision surgery at his cervical spine level in the next 30 years, say 30 years out from now? What I would say is, is this. Um, I feel very comfortable saying he will require another surgery. I've done my best to give what I believe is the, uh, the most likely surgery he has. Um, I don't feel comfortable saying that at this point I'm going to revise the index level. Um, his facets look good, his disc is functioning very well, and so I don't feel comfortable stating that or giving you a number because I don't quite have that number yet. I do my okay. best to answer all the questions. Honestly, I don't have that number. Very good. Thank you, Doctor. Okay.